what's the shortest distance between two points? A line. Well, that's kind of only true in certain kinds of geometry. So I often tell my students that math teachers lie all the time, but even that's a little bit of a lie. What I mean by that is that math teachers don't always explain exactly why something happens in full detail, or sometimes they'll tell you a shortcut that actually isn't really true in general. This sometimes is kind of frustrating because some of the rules that you might think are true may not actually hold in more general kinds of applications. A nice example of this in the small is when you were told as a child that you couldn't subtract a larger number from a bigger one, like five minus eight somehow just doesn't make sense. But as you got older, you realized that what we were really trying to avoid was the idea of negative numbers so as not to like overstress the situation. Now, I would argue that actually little kids probably can understand negative numbers. It's not that really big of a deal, especially if you compare it to say like a game board, but that's not the point of this video. The point of this video is that I want to get to an idea here that we often hear a lot, but is actually not necessarily true, at least not in every setting. And that's the idea that a line is the shortest distance between two points. You hear this all the time. Anybody asks you, what's the shortest distance between two points? A line. Well, that's kind of only true in certain kinds of geometries. So if you're on a flat piece of paper, yeah, a line is the shortest distance between two points. But what happens if you're on something like a sphere and you have to stay on the sphere? If you try to draw a straight line between two points on the sphere, you're going to have to drill that hole through the sphere to get to the other point. That doesn't stay on the sphere. So how do you find the shortest distance between two points there? Part of the issue is that that's not necessarily the right question to even ask because that's not what's fundamentally true about a line. Yeah, it's the shortest distance between two points, but that's not what makes a line a line. If we can figure out what makes a line a line, maybe we can have an idea of how to generalize that to more complicated spaces. So let's think about what actually makes a line a line. Now, if you've taken a calculus class, you understand something called a derivative, which is a rate of change. Now, if you haven't taken a calculus class, that's okay. We're going to talk a little bit about the derivative, so if you want an idea on what that is or what a rate of change is, you can pause this video now and watch a walk and talk video that I made that explains the basic ideas of differential calculus and gets at the idea of what a derivative is. A derivative, though, is an instantaneous rate of change of a function. Now, for a line to be a line, it has to have special properties about its rate of change. For one thing, we know that the rate of change of a function is the slope of that function. Well, lines have constant slope. So what that means is that their first derivative, their first instantaneous rate of change, is always going to be a constant value that doesn't change. That's what it means actually to be a line. But we can actually go one step further, and we can talk about the second derivative, which is the derivative of the derivative. So the rate of change of the rate of change. Now, if that's not a familiar concept to you, that's okay. You can think of it like this. If I'm moving in my car, the rate of change of my position is the velocity of the car. My rate of change of my velocity or how fast my velocity changes is something we call acceleration. And that's the derivative of the derivative of position. So velocity is the first derivative of position. Acceleration is the second derivative of position. So if you have a line where you know that the derivative or its rate of change is constant everywhere, the derivative of its derivative would be the rate of change of its rate of change. Well, if the rate of change of that line is constant, it's not changing. So the rate of change of its rate of change is going to have to be zero. So another way to say this is that a line is a function who has a zero second derivative. So the rate of change of its rate of change is zero. Now we can go one step further with this and we can think of it in terms of velocity and acceleration. And another way to phrase that same idea is that a line is a non-accelerating curve because there's no acceleration on that curve. There's no second derivative, which is what the acceleration is. So a straight line or a line on a flat piece of paper 
is a line whose second derivative vanishes, a non-accelerating curve. So how does this help us? This characterizes completely what a line is in the xy space, in, in 2D. And in fact, if you extend this to a vector kind of calculus idea where the velocity or rate of change of a curve is its tangent vector, this actually works even there. So if we think about a line in 3D, its tangent vector is which way it's pointing at any given point. Now for a line, that's always pointing in the same direction. That's what makes it a line. So if we try to find the rate of change of that tangent vector along the curve, which is like in the direction of that tangent vector, that'll never change. So that second derivative will be zero. So on a line, the directional derivative of a tangent vector in the direction of its tangent vector, which it means in the direction of the curve, will be zero because that tangent vector on that line never changes. That line always points in the same direction. And that's the way we can describe this. That's a non-accelerating curve. Even in multiple dimensions, it's one where the tangent vector never changes. So if we go to a more complicated object like a sphere, the question we really want to ask is what's the analog of a line on that sphere? In other words, what's the straightest possible path you can follow if you have to stay on the sphere? And this is where a branch of mathematics called differential geometry comes into play. Differential geometry is the idea of how do you do calculus on a curvy space? That's the basic broad strokes idea of what differential geometry is. So in this case, if we're trying to figure out what the straightest possible line is on a curvy space, we have to understand how to move infinitesimally along that space. So if you're talking about derivatives, the way you compute derivatives of a function is you look at two points nearby and you look at the secant line between them and then move those two points closer and closer together to get to a tangent line. So really, in some sense, what we're looking at is we're trying to understand what's the rate of change of infinitesimally moving between two different points, okay? Moving in just a tiny little bit in a straight line. Now, the problem is, is that if you want to talk about that on, say, the surface of a sphere, so you have some curve drawn out on the surface of a sphere, and you want to talk about how much does it change along that path, well, the issue is, is that part of that change is due to the fact that the sphere is curved, and part of it is due to the curve. So because its motion is due to both things, you kind of have to be a little careful about how you calculate this derivative. Because the motion change, which way its tangent vector is going to change, is going to be affected by both the curve and the fact that you have to stay on the surface. So what we do is, is instead of talking about just infinitesimally moving in a straight line, which would necessarily take you off the sphere, we're going to infinitesimally move along the sphere. So we have to introduce, for lack of a better way to explain this, a type of curved derivative. The mathematical name for it is a connection well, specifically the Levi-Civita connection, but don't worry about that. And so once we do this, once we figure out that we have this curved derivative, which takes into account how much the curve changes because it's on the surface, we can then take use that curved derivative to compute the derivative of that curve, and that'll tell us how much the curve's actually going to change, both in due to the curve itself and to the curved surface that it's on. Well, this gives us a way now to talk about what the straightest possible line would be. Because if we look back at what made a line a line in the xy or xyz space, the regular flat space, it was the fact that it had zero second derivative. So in this case, what we'll look at is zero second curved derivative. So we take the directional curved derivative of the tangent vector of a curve in the direction of that tangent vector. And any curve for which that value is zero doesn't have a second curve derivative, which means it's as straight as it possibly can be. So there's no motion on that other than how it's moving on the sphere itself. So the only motion that this line is affected by, this curve is affected by, is just having to stay on the surface. That's what getting that second curve derivative equal to zero will mean. So with respect to that surface, that tangent vector never changes direction. Or in other words, the only changes of direction that that tangent vector experiences is what's required to keep it on the surface. That is as straight as you possibly can be on that surface. Now, any curve that satisfies this condition where it's curved derivative of its tangent vector in the direction of its tangent vector is zero, 
is what we call in differential geometry a geodesic. So this is the straightest possible curve you can have. On a sphere, you find out that these geodesics, these non-accelerating curves, are great circles or circles that have the same diameter as the sphere itself, which means, of course, that it, the diameter of each great circle goes through the center of the sphere as well. Now, on the surface of the Earth, which is a sphere, roughly, the geodesics that we know commonly are longitude lines. Every single longitude line that goes through the North and South Pole is a geodesic. They're all great circles that have the same diameter as the sphere. But the only latitude line that's a great circle is the equator. Every other latitude line is a circle that has a smaller radius because they go up you know, with sort of the height. So the equator is the only great circle latitude line. So what happens is, is that means that on the surface of a sphere, the straightest possible line between two points is along a great circle. And it turns out that the straightest possible curve is also the curve that minimizes the distance between two points. So if you have two points on the surface of a sphere, or say two points on the surface of the Earth, the shortest distance between those two points is not going to be the straight line path between them, because you have to stay on the sphere. So the shortest distance of the, between those two points is going to be the shortest distance that stays on the sphere. Well, the straightest possible curve that does that is the great circle. So the great circle path between those two points, and there's only one of them unless they're antipodal points, meaning exactly opposite on the sides of the sphere, then you have infinitely many because they're like longitude lines. But if they're not antipodal points, then there's a unique geodesic between them, a unique great circle between those two points. And that's going to be the shortest possible path. Now, unfortunately, you can't define a geodesic as being the shortest path between two points because when you have those two points, there's a great circle they're on. The part of the great circle between the two points, that's the shortest path and it's geodesic. But you can also go around the back of the earth, around the back of the sphere along that same geodesic. And that's still geodesic motion, but it's not the shortest path between those two points. So not every geodesic between two points is necessarily the shortest path, but the shortest path between two points will always be a geodesic. There are just other geodesic paths possible too. So ultimately what I wanted to get at is that there is a little bit of a lie that math teachers tell you when they say the shortest distance between two points is a line. That's only true if you're in a flat space like Rn. So the xy plane, the xyz space, that kind of thing. Then the shortest distance between them is a straight line. But on a curved surface like a torus, like a donut, or a sphere, or any other kind of shape that's curved, the shortest distance between two points will be along a geodesic path. And geodesics are non-accelerating curves where the term non-accelerating means zero second curve derivative. And that's actually what the shortest distance is between two points, is the minimum geodesic path between them. But, you know, if somebody asked you what's the shortest distance between two points and you responded with, it's the minimum geodesic distance between them, they'd probably look at you pretty funny. So maybe the best answer is still to say, align. <laughs>